Father, we come before you right now by the precious blood of the Lamb. We thank you for another Shabbat of being able to come together as your people Israel. Natural branches were grafted in, but one body, one in Messiah Yeshua. Father, we just ask that you open the eyes of our understanding, that you enlighten us to the hope of your calling today as we study your Torah. We just give you the praise, honor, and the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. The Torah portion this week. Now, everybody read it, right? I know the students did because they told me they did. <laughs> okay, well, Beshalach, when he sent, is what it is, and it comes from Exodus Shemot 13, starting at verse 17. We'll go ahead and start reading with verse 17. When Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not let them take the road to the Philistines' territory, although it was the shortest. In case, God thought, the prospect of fighting makes the people change their mind and turn back to Egypt. Instead, God led the people a roundabout way through the desert of the Red uh, Sea of Reeds. The Israelites left fully armed. Now, it talks about they left harnessed, I think, in the King James. There's a number of different ways it's translated, but fully armed is an interesting translation. This is the New Jerusalem Bible. Moses took with him the bones of Joseph. Since Joseph had put the Israelites on solemn oath with the words, it is sure that God will visit you, he had said, and when the day comes, you must take my bones away from here with you. Actually, let me stop here. I'm going to go ahead and put the mic on. I just remembered we didn't get that, and it's not going to record well if we don't. I'll just use the handheld. No, we'll just keep going from here. All right, so they set out from Sukkot and encamped at Etam on the edge of the desert. Yahweh preceded them by day in a pillar of cloud to show them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could march by day and by night. The pillar of cloud never left its place ahead of the people during the day, nor the pillar of fire during the night. So the Israelites left Egypt fully armed, but it wasn't so that they could fight the government. Yahweh took care of the government. He definitely, it was the strongest, mightiest army on earth at the time, <laughs> and Yahweh dealt with him. So the thing is, we're going to see in 1 Corinthians 10 when we read, these things were done for our examples. And the way it happened back then, it's going to unfold probably pretty close to that in these last days. There's going to be a time of great tribulation like this, or there's, there's never seen, like it's talked about. Now, a lot of us grew up believing in a pre-trib rapture. But... As I've studied, I've come to see that the rapture, it's a true teaching, but we're not taken to heaven. What it is, in Jeremiah, there's a scripture that talks about in the last days, and all the prophets talk about this just about, when God takes Israel from all the nations where he scattered them and brings them back to the land. And Jeremiah says, at this time, you're not even going to remember the exodus from Egypt. And this was our Torah portion this week. It was pretty spectacular. What's taking place is going to be even more spectacular than that. And the only thing I can see that fits the bill is the rapture. When Yeshua comes back and we rise up to meet him in the air, we're not going back to heaven with him because he's coming to rule and reign at Jerusalem. And we're going to be caught up with him and taken back with him, the ones that have made him their Lord. Now the rest of the, the Jews or Israelites that when they see him, they're going to mourn as one mourns for a brother. They're going to repent at that point and become born again. But when he comes back, they won't be. So they're going to have to end up hoofing it back. It talks about how the river Euphrates, I think, is dried up so that they can make it back. And Gentiles are going to bear them on their shoulders and everything else. So some of us, though, are going to be ready. And we're going to actually literally be raptured up to meet him in the clouds and go back and rule and reign with him at Jerusalem. Now, the reason being that I don't believe there's going to be a pre-trib rapture other than the fact that there's really no scripture to support it if you study it in context what did Yeshua talk about when he says, Behold, the fields are white unto harvest? He said, Pray that the Father would send forth laborers into the harvest. Well, right now we're living under the scenario that straight and narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and few there be that find it. But yet that's going to change. In Revelation chapter 7, it mentions a multitude that can't be numbered that comes out of the midst of great tribulation from all nations. This happens during the great tribulation. But they don't just magically become believers. There's laborers bringing in the harvest. And it's a result of Joel's latter rain. If you study the prophecies in Joel, in Peter in Acts chapter 2, he says, this is that which is prophesied by Joel. Well, you go back and you read Joel, and it's talking about right before the coming of the day of Yahweh, right before Yeshua returns. Well, there was a former rain and a latter rain it mentions back then. The former rain was 2,000 years ago. Uh, 3,000 were saved the first day. There was another 5,000 added a couple days later. It was big numbers but not numbers that you couldn't number. 
But this next harvest during Revelation chapter 7, it's a multitude that can't be numbered that comes out of the midst of great tribulation from all nations. We are a hand-picked army to help bring in the biggest harvest this earth has ever seen. It's the precious fruit of the earth that he has great patience for. It talks about it in, in James. And he's talking about the former and the latter rain in James as well. He's quoting from Joel. So that's why I believe we're here. Now we're going to be protected. There is a place of protection in the midst of tribulation. And there's supernatural protection for his people that are sealed with the, the seal of God. There's a lot of different things you can look at. So we will be protected. But we're here for a job. We've got a mission to accomplish. And it is to help bring in the greatest harvest that this earth has ever seen. And I believe we'll see the rapture. But it's when Yeshua actually comes back. That's when he actually gathers the remnants of Israel from all the nations where he scattered them. Brother Steve. Well, I was just uh, thinking this. this I was just thinking about this uh, yesterday and today. Um, in Matthew 25, along about chapter, verse 31, Yeshua talks about when the Son of Man comes back to judge, and he says he judges the nations. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm assuming that that means that Israel, the, you know, the, the bride has already been exempted from judgment because they were of faith in Yeshua. Well, they're judged during the 42 months. That's what that's right. about Jacob's trouble. And because they're wicked, he says in, in Zechariah 14, he gathers all the armies, all of the, all the nations at Jerusalem, and the city's taken at that point, and then it's tread underfoot for 42 months, it tells us in Revelation chapter 12, or 11. Well, the point I was making, though, is that what Yeshua is doing is judging the nations, and as and as you have... Goim, yeah. Right, the Goim. And as you have pointed out before, he doesn't judge them on how well they kept the Sabbath or how good they kept kosher. Yeah. But the more weightier matters of the law. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. Sick and you came and visited me in prison. And these are the things we're going to be judged by. So these are the things we're supposed to be working on, not how well we can keep the Torah or, or the Sabbath or anything else. Although those are important. But they're, not as important but they're not as important as the things that... Because he says, when you do it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. Yeah. This is what we're doing to the Messiah himself. So. What does the John say in the little John's that you can't say you love God and you can't see... You if you don't love brother. the men that you can see, yeah. exactly. That's it. So anyway, we're here for a reason. And it is to bring in the greatest harvest that the earth has ever seen. So it's going to probably unfold pretty much like it did back in the wilderness before when the woman flees to the wilderness where she has a place protected of protection prepared for in Revelation 12 it talks about it for 42 months and it also mentions a time times and half a time well that's the same time that's given in Daniel 7 that the little horn is given power to make war with the saints and to overcome them it's the ones that didn't go to that place of protection that are being overcome so there will be protection and then then there will be a lot of martyrs too it talks about that at the fifth seal in Revelation that there's a bunch of people under the throne room that have been beheaded for the word of Messiah so anyway let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 starting at verse 1 it says moreover brethren I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Messiah. There's a rabbinic tradition that says that Miriam carried this rock around with her. The rock that gave water. Well, there was a rock that literally followed them. But it was the Messiah is what we're told by Paul. Yep, But the mo uh, most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, and the intent that we should not lust after evil things, that as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit, sec uh, commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Messiah, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages has come. The last generation it's talking to. So these things were done for our examples. In other words, we're going to be facing a lot of these same trials and tribulations as what the Israelites did in the wilderness. So our forefathers experienced these things, and they, they blew it a lot. We can learn from their mistakes and make sure that we keep our hearts right, 
And we know that these are tests, as we're going to study. Yahweh tests his people to see if we will keep his commandments or not, to see if we love him or not. Go ahead and scroll down. In Luke 22:35, this is Yeshua talking to us. He says to them, to the disciples, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And that he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So not every one of them was armed. But he did tell them that you need to sell your extra garment and buy a sword. He expects us to protect ourselves as we saw in this week's Torah portion. We didn't have to worry about the government. He took care of them. But we did have to deal with somebody. Do you remember who it was? The Amalekites, Amalek. And as we study, he actually gave us instruction that their name is to be blotted out. That spirit is, definitely. Yep. And we see it in Israel right now. That same spirit is there. The terrorists that pick off the weak, the children, the stragglers. The same spirit that Amalek was doing in the wilderness. And it's already come here. We can see it going on, and it's just going to grow worse and worse as we draw towards the end. Yeshua doesn't want us to be defenseless. He wants us to protect our families and to protect one another. Because we've got a job to do. There's a harvest to be brought in, and he wants us here to do that. So not everybody had to have a sword. But we were instructed to sell our extra garment and get one if we didn't have one. So Deuteronomy 25:17, he tells us, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when Yahweh your God has given you rest from your enemies all around, in the land which Yahweh your God has given you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. We're commanded to blot out the remembrance of Amalek. So... There is a time to turn the other cheek. We know from Stephen's example that there's a time to lay down your life. The early apostles, all of them but one, laid down their life for the gospel in the proper timing. But the thing is, we've got to learn his voice because he's going to instruct us what he wants us to do. But until he tells us to lay down our life, he wants us to protect our families. Do you have something, Brother Steve? I was just going to mention real quick that I remember the rabbis uh, telling me that the turning the other cheek that's so often quoted meant to other Jews, but not necessarily to Gentiles that are trying to kill you, or beat you, or rob you for no reason. Well, it's a thing of the Spirit. That's what they... And the whole point with being in covenant relationship with the Father through the blood of Yeshua, he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now why is that? Well, we're bond servants. A bond servant, it's, it's where you put your ear to the doorpost and you drive it through with an awl and you're a, you're a bond servant for the rest of your life. We are bought with a price. We're not our own. The Father said he will take care of us. That we're not to seek vengeance because he has our backs. We're not our own. He's the one that is responsible for taking care of his own. And then he says, who are you to judge another man's servant? We are his servants. We are his bond servants. And that's why we're not to seek our own vengeance because he's the one that is responsible for it. He doesn't want us to seek vengeance. But there's a difference between seeking vengeance and protecting your family because we as the priests of our family are responsible for protecting our own too. We're to provide for our own. And it says if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. He's not just talking about money. That's part of it. But it's protection. It's spiritual covering. There's a number of different things that it's talking about. So we have a responsibility to protect our families. So we can see that spirit of Amalek working in Islam even today in Israel. Out in California not too long ago. I mean, it is here, and it's just going to get worse and worse. Yeah, he cut her head off and went to try to do it to another one. So, I mean, it's, it's here. It's here among us, and he's wanting us to be ready for it because Amalek is alive and well, unfortunately. So we are to be prepared to deal with Amalek. There again, we don't have to worry about the government. God's going to take care of that. We've never been instructed to be governmental protesters. Yeshua was living under an occupation even in his time and did not come against Rome. 
He said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. So we're not to be rebellious against the government, but we are to protect our own families against the spirit of Amalek. Go ahead and scroll down. So this Torah portion, over and over, he talks about testing, and I want us to look at that. In Exodus 16, starting at verse 4, it says, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my Torah or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So they gathered it every morning, verse 21, and every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they had gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what Yahweh has said, tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to Yahweh. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink. Go ahead and scroll. Nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And Yahweh said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for Yahweh has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now we're all accountable to Yahweh for obedience to his commandments, to his Torah. We know that Yeshua says that all the law and the prophets hang on two commands. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, which is what the Shema is about. And then also from the Leviticus, we must love our neighbor as ourself. He says all the rest of the law and the promise, uh, prophets hang on these two commands because these are the two commands about loving God and loving our neighbor. The rest of the Torah is how to do that by his definition. You can't throw out the Torah and make up your own definition and expect Yahweh to consider it true love. Because he defines what love is. And it's laid out in his Torah. It's all about love. That's why in Matthew 7, when the people stand before him, they say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did mighty works in your name. But he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who are lawless. What does keeping the Torah have to do with eternal damnation? Because they're casting the lake of fire there. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 has a parallel passage. It says, so, though I have understand, uh, though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains or cast out demons or do mighty works, if I don't have love, I am nothing. And it's got to be love by his definition. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about one aspect of love, but five chapters earlier, or eight chapters earlier in 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul says there's this man that has his father's wife, you put him outside of your fellowship, you don't even eat with him, and I'm turning him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of Messiah. Well, that doesn't sound like the love 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about, but yet Paul wrote that chapter, and this is love, because the Torah says that's the death penalty. That's a sin unto death, and we have to deal with it as a body. Now, they didn't take him out and stone him because they were living under the laws of Corinth, but yet it was still a death penalty. Paul turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. But they didn't make him comfortable in the sin, like homosexuals in, <laughs> in positions in churches today. And these things are an abomination. And we, are, as Yahweh's people, are to take a stand against it. That is a death penalty. Sins unto death have to be dealt with. Now, 1 John 5 says, if you see your brother sin a sin that's not unto death, I say, ask, and I will give life to him that sins not unto death. He says, there is a sin unto death, and I say, don't ask for that. Well, the sin unto death, if you look at the Torah, if it carries a death penalty, it's a sin unto death. If it doesn't, it's not a sin unto death. And so we can cover the sins in each other's lives that are not unto death, but the death penalty sins we have to deal with as a body if it's taken place in our midst. Because that person would die and go to hell if we didn't deal with it. Not to mention the fact that it would look like for the rest of the congregation it's alright to do that kind of stuff. And it would spread like a cancer. And Yahweh doesn't want that. That's why it had the death penalty to start with. That was the way that they would actually do exorcisms back then. They'd take them out and stone them. They had to get the demonic forces out because sins unto death are demonically inspired. They're, they're a serious thing. So 
we're all accountable to Yahweh. But if you notice, Yahweh dealt with Moses when these people went out and they gathered, looked for the man on the this, this Shabbat. What did Moses have to do with it? Well, we are held accountable as a body. Look at uh, Achan. One man sins, and the next time they go to war, a bunch of other people lose their lives as a result. We are a body. We're the body of Messiah, and we're accountable one to another. That's why we're supposed to be covering each other when we see a brother sin a sin that's not unto death. We have to cover that. We have to make sure it's covered. And if there's a sin unto death, we have to deal with it. Because we are accountable as a body to Yahweh. And Moses had to deal with it. So anyway, it's not just an individual thing. It's a corporate thing as well. So in Exodus 20, 18, he goes on and he talks about another testing. He says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you. God wants us to fear him. Now, a lot of people talk about how it's just an awesome respect. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But we're going to look and see that Yeshua mentions it as well. That his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. He wants us to be afraid of the penalty for willful disobedience. In the, it talks about in Hebrews 10, I didn't write this down, but it talks about if we sin willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for our sin, but a fearful, certain looking of fiery indignation. Well, if you go back and you study in, in Numbers chapter 15, I believe it is, the first part, it talks about if you sin unintentionally, then when you discover that you've sinned, you're to bring a, a sheep and, and, or a goat or whatever it was. I believe it was a goat. And take it to the priest, and then he would, you actually had to kill it, and then he would offer it before Yahweh, and your sin would be atoned for. It says, but if you sin willfully, there is no sacrifice for that. You are cut off. Well, Hebrews is just reflecting the Torah. There never was a sacrifice for willful, intentional sin. There was only one sacrifice that would atone for it, if you could make it. And that was the sacrifice at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That was the only sin that would atone for all the sins of Israel. Otherwise, you were cut off. Because willful, intentional sin has never been something that Yahweh would put up for. Now, Yeshua's sacrifice, we see it in uh, Isaiah 53, it covers willful, intentional sin as well. So if we're in Yeshua and we truly repent, he will forgive us. And that was the whole point of Paul putting that man out of the assembly. It looks like in 2 Corinthians that that man did repent and it looks like they brought him back in. That's the ultimate goal is that his spirit would be saved in the day of Messiah. So he doesn't want us to end up having the same reward as the enemy. He wants to bring reconciliation. That's what he does in all judging of Israel and, and the nations and everything. It's all about reconciliation. He's trying to bring people back to repentance. So Yahweh tests us again at Mount Sinai so that his fear would be before us that we may not sin. He wants us to have godly fear. And Yeshua talks about it in Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We are to have godly fear. That's the problem in a lot of the churches today. God's our buddy now. There's even some places that talk about commanding God. It, it just, it's taught. And there's scripture that looks like it's supported. But the thing is, he is our friend. Yeshua says there is a friend that sticks closer to a brother. But we still have to understand that just because you're the son of the king, if you go into the throne room and you, you diss the king in front of everybody else, you're going to be executed. We've got to have that godly fear. God is the creator of the universe, and there's a protocol. We have to do things his ways. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't, and you willfully and intentionally violate it, knowing better, he says you're cut off. It's a serious thing. So we have to have that godly fear, because not only can we be cut off, it puts us out there as fair game for the enemy. We have removed ourselves from the protection of Yahweh, and then Satan has free game. So we've got to all have that healthy dose of fear for Yahweh. Fear of being out of his will. Fear of leaving that secret place of the Most High. Because there's a place of protection that we can stay in constantly, if we so choose. In Deuteronomy 8, 2, it says, And you shall remember that Yahweh your God led you all these uh, 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you 
to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahweh. So he will test us. And we might have to see some hunger or some thirst in these last days, but we have to learn and remember that Yahweh's wanting to see what's in our heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeshua talks about what is truly in our heart. When we're put under some pressure, you'll see what's in your heart. And sometimes he does that to see what's there because he wants us to be ready to go through anything. And he will bring us out of everything if we're, we're faithful and we keep our heart right. Joseph was a prime example of that. Joseph did almost everything right. And yes, he, he suffered this persecution that he didn't really deserve, but he kept his heart right. And as a result, he ended up saving the whole nation of Israel and the whole world, basically, because he kept his heart right. There's always going to be light at the end of the tunnel. He will take us through every situation. In Deuteronomy 8.11, Beware that you do not forget Yahweh your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses to dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions, scorpions and in a thirsty land where was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know. And by the way, manna means, what is it? Literally in Hebrew, <laughs> it's, what is it? They didn't know. <clears throat> what your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you, to do you good. Go ahead and scroll. In the end, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget Yahweh your God, and follow other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify you against you this day, that you shall surely perish. We can let money become a god if we're not careful. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil, not money itself. Money is a tool, and it can be very useful. People that don't have any can have the love of money. That can be their goal in life is to try to get it. And that is a wrong, that's a wrong goal. He wants us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us. Like he said in the Torah. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you'll make your way prosperous. And then you'll have good success. First comes the kingdom of God. That's what he says in Deuteronomy 28. If you do the things contained in this book of the law, then all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. We do our part first, and he is faithful to do his part. You can count on it. Literally, you can take it to the bank. So Yahweh tests us again to humble us and pr produce his fear so that he can bless us and so that we won't follow other gods. He wants us to be prepared. He wants to harden us in the times when it's good so that we can stand in the times when it's not good. And he's preparing us now for what lies ahead. We're getting close to the end. I don't think it's quite as close as what some people think, but I think we're going to see it in our lifetime. And I think he's getting us ready. In Judges 2, 19, it says, And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve him and to bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of Yahweh was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of Yahweh, to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore Yahweh left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hands of Joshua. So he'll use even our enemies to test us if we get into rebellion, if we stop serving him and we turn away. Something that may be noticeable to the older folks is that when this country 
kicked God out of school and kicked God out of the government and everything else about 50 or 60 years ago, we began to go downhill quick. And now, today, when I was a little kid, um, the things that people say and the things that people do, uh, at the very least, would have brought you a beat down. <laughs> if you were lucky, you know, um, they didn't put up with the stuff that we take for granted nowadays. Homosexuality, gay marriage, all the foul language and the, the filth and everything that they put on the in music and uh, everywhere. It was it would not be tolerated. And these were people that the vast majority of Americans they believed in God and they mostly went to church. Most of them did, and uh, they they tried to keep all the law that they knew and did the best they could. They were ignorant of a lot of things, but what they knew they walked in, yeah. and they were blessed because of it. Yeah. That's just it. We don't have to know it all to be blessed, but we have to do all that we do know. That's the thing. I mean, because it's a growth process. If you're raised in it, you're held to a higher standard than if you just come into it and you're ignorant to start with. In Acts 15, it talks about the Gentiles that are coming to faith. They're only given four things to do. Abstain from fornication, from things offered to idols, from things strangled, and from blood. Basically, this was all in context, it was what do we do for salvation? Because the Judaizers were teaching them you have to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised to be saved. And that is a lie. Abraham was saved for years before God gave him circumcision. And he didn't have all the law. He married his sister. That was against Torah. He didn't know any better because it wasn't against the law when, when he married. But anyway, he walked in what he knew. So he didn't have to know it all. He was walking in covenant with Yahweh. And when Yahweh would reveal something else to him, he'd, he'd embrace it. He'd walk in it. So the Gentiles, basically in Acts 15, were told to repent. Stop doing these things you did to your demon gods. And then they're told that Moses has those that teach him in the synagogue every Sabbath. Basically, go learn what you've been made partaker of. Well, back then, it took three years to go through the Torah. They were on a three or three and a half year cycle. So they wouldn't even hear the whole thing for at least three years. And obviously, they're not going to memorize the whole thing in that amount of time. It's going to take them years to be able to know it all, to be able to walk in all of it. So it's a process. It's a growth process. Our forefathers, our families that didn't understand Torah, doesn't mean they all went to hell. If they were walking in the revelation that God had given them with all their hearts, we're going to see them again one day. That's the important thing, because he's after our hearts. It's good to know things, because the blessing comes with that, but he's after our hearts primarily. Just a question about the sister. It was his half-sister, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it was his half-sister. It was the daughter of his father, but not, they didn't have the same mother. mother. Yeah, they had different mothers, that's what it was. But that's still outlawed by the Torah. We're not supposed to marry a close kinsperson like that. So We can see the Torah being unveiled as we draw closer to the end. Mount Sinai was the basically the, the revelation when it was written down of the fullness of the Torah. But there were things passed down from the Garden of Eden. How did Cain and Abel know what to offer or what to sacrifice for Yahweh? Aaron and Moses and Marion's parents. Father was the nephew to their mother. Yep. Yep, so the gene pool obviously was starting to deteriorate when it came time at Mount Sinai, and God had to put some rules in place so that there weren't intermarriages and in in start having birth defects and everything. So, But originally, the gene pool was not corrupted, so they could marry. I mean, how did, how did Cain find a wife? How did Seth find a wife? Had to marry a sister. That's all there was back then. And, and it was fine because the gene pool was completely pristine back then. So yeah, so anyway, that's, that's what happened. Just like you can do that with animals today and still come out with, with good animals. That's how they get different breeds of dogs and things is they continue to interbreed them until they end up with what they want. So it was possible with humans back then until sin entered and then corruption and eventually things became to the point where Yahweh had to set down the rules where we wouldn't have that problem. So Yahweh will test us even with defeat when we sin to bring us back to him. When we know our enemies are getting the upper hand, we better start examining our lives because there's been some way that the door has been opened. And usually you're going to know it because you're just in rebellion, and that's what Yahweh uses to bring you back. So James talks about, in verse 2 of chapter 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So when the trials come, we don't always know what the source of it is. Is it Yahweh testing us? Is it the devil that he's using? Like in Job's situation, Job was able to make it through everything and even had more abundance when he was done because he kept his heart right. So we're going to make it through. God is going to bring us through every situation, but we need to keep our hearts right. We have to count it all joy, and we know that he is doing this for our good. He's getting us ready for what lies ahead so that we won't fail in the midst of what is coming on the earth. Life is a series of tests preparing us for eternity. Yahweh will test us in various ways. One way is how we keep his Shabbat. That's a big way. The Sabbath is one of the major signs of the fact that we're his people. As we study, we'll see. Exodus 6, 4, we already read this. But he was given us manna that I may test them whether they will walk in my Torah or not. And then he talks about bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning because the next day was going to be the Sabbath. In verse 26, he says, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Shabbat, the Sabbath, there will be none. Go ahead and scroll down. So we can see that this was a test. He says, See, for Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So the Sabbath is the first thing that Yahweh made holy in creation. If you go back to Genesis, he rested on the seventh day. He sanctified it. He made it holy. It's, it's an important thing to him. He did it right in the beginning as an example of what he wants his people to do. It's a day literally set aside for fellowship. He wants to walk with us in the cool of the day just like he did with Adam. And he set aside a whole day, one day every week, so that we can spend that time fellowshipping with him, fellowshipping with his body, with each other. As we're going to see, having a holy assembly is literally a commandment for the Sabbath. But in Genesis 2, verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, made it holy, literally. Because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So in the Tanakh... In Genesis 2, 3, it says, Then God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because on it God ceased from all the works of creation, which he had done. Literally, he made the Sabbath holy. It was the first thing in all of creation that he made holy. I just wanted to point out that it's, it's not apparent to us in this modern time so much, but <clears throat> just a hundred years or so ago, people here in America had to work long, hard days. They had to work at least six days just to survive. The women worked from before the sun come up until the sun went down. They, I mean, they cost, that saying a woman's work is never done was really true then. I mean, they had to hand wash everything. They had to scrub. They had to fix men clothes, cook, you, know, you name it. They had to do it all. And the men were out in the fields working their hineys off all from early in the morning till and when they came in they were dragging their aha because and they didn't have time to read a bible or, or think or talk about scripture so they really really needed a day dedicated to resting in the lord yeah. amen the day that we all look forward to so the Sabbath was the day that Yeshua assembled on. It talks about in 1 John 2, 6, that it, if we say we are His, we should walk even as He walked. Amen. Now a lot of us, I mean, we remember that old saying, WWJD, what would Yeshua do, basically? <laughs> what would Jews do, huh? <laughs> I used to say it meant, well, what, is, what would Jeroboam do? Because pretty much that's what <laughs> most of the people are doing, making their own holy days up and throwing Yahweh's days out. So <laughs> anyway, but we're literally supposed to do what Yeshua would do. And uh, in Luke 4, we can see what he did. Go ahead and scroll down. So he came to, to uh, Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was which means he did it all the time. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. 
And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Why was everybody staring at him just because he finished reading and sat down? He didn't finish the verse. No. You go back and you read in Isaiah, he stopped mid-sentence and sat down because where he stopped was what he was here to do the first time. The rest of it talked about what he's doing when he comes back the second time. And that was part of the, uh, the Haftor portion back then on the three-year cycle. It's not read today because we're on the one-year cycle, but it was back then. And nobody had ever stopped mid-sentence and sat down before. And then he said, this day, has this been fulfilled in your hearing? And nobody had ever done that before either. So he was, he was doing things that only the Messiah would do. Uh, as you said, they, they don't read that. The Torah portion that went with that Hoff Torah portion has been changed. Well, it's, it's on a three and a half year cycle. Yeah, but I mean, it originally pointed to a place where basically the Torah portion ended with saying, today... Yahweh your God stands before you. And so that's why they got mad wanted to stone him. They were freaking out because he's... <laughs> yeah. Well, that wasn't the first time. He, they did it in John 10, too, when he says, I'm the good shepherd. Yeah. I give eternal life. I hold you in my hand. No man plucks you out. And then he says, my father holds you in his hand, and no man plucks you out. And then he said something that we're going to look at a little bit later. I and my father are echad. We are one. Echad, the word right in the middle. That's what it means. One, but it's a... It's a complex one. It's not just one and one alone. If you study out its use throughout the Tanakh, you'll see that it's used for a husband and wife is to become one flesh. So anyway, it's really interesting. There's something in the jots and the tittles that's even more interesting. Well, the question was on the... It was his, his uh, custom. Was his custom to read every Sabbath? Well, in the synagogue, they literally would have seven readers. If you get, have a uh, um, complete Jewish Bible, or at least the complete, well, yeah, it would be in the complete Jewish Bible in, in the Torah, you can see it's divided into seven different portions. Each Torah portion is divided into seven different readings. And so they would have seven different people come up and read. And the first one that would come up would be a Kohen or a priest, if they had one in their presence. And he would come up and read the first portion, and then they would, they would go on and uh, the last portion that was read was the Haftor portion, which is what Yeshua did. So he was the seventh reader on this particular day. So it was an assigned portion. He didn't just open up the scroll and pick something at random. This was the Haftor portion for this time of this cycle. During the, every synagogue in, in all of Israel was reading that same portion. They're uh, just picked out at random, it's, it would seem, but obviously this was the timing of Yahweh when he came and read this particular portion because it's what the message was Yahweh wanted him to give. So, But anyway, it's different. We used to actually do the three-year portion when we were meeting before, and uh, we're doing the one-year right now since it's the easiest to get things for, and we might eventually go back to the three. You go on the three or three-and-a-half-year, you have more time to be able to dig in deeper into the portion because you're only reading a couple chapters out of, out of each portion that way. So anyway, <clears throat> it talks about John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, go back, um, scroll back up a little bit. Looks like you skipped something. Okay, no. He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So, it talks about in Revelation how John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So what day was the Lord's day? We're taught that it's Sunday because that's the day that Yeshua rose from the dead. But guess what? The day he rose from the dead was on a Sunday every year. It never changed. It was from Mount Sinai. It was called the wave offering of the first fruit. And it's when he told Mary, don't touch me, I've not yet ascended. And he went up and presented himself as the first fruits. And it talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, he's the first fruit of the brethren. So he is our first fruit. But it was always done on a Sunday. Pentecost was always on a Sunday. 
Well, no, but the way it was kept biblically, it was the day after Shabbat, if you study that in the Hebrew, and that was the weekly Sabbath. And so the day after the weekly Sabbath was always on a Sunday. It wasn't that, that God was changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. These days were always on Sunday from Mount Sinai. It was just Yeshua fulfilling a particular holy day when he went and ascended. So we'll see scripturally what the Lord's Day really is. In Isaiah 58, 13, it says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day... The first day he made holy in Genesis is the Sabbath. That is his holy day. So the Shabbat is Yahweh's, or the, the Lord's holy day. So we're instructed to delight ourselves in Yahweh. And in Psalms 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself also in Yahweh, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Does that mean what your heart's lusting for? No, what it means is he's going to put his desires in your heart. When you're delighting in him, the things that you desire are going to be what's in from his heart and you're going to have what you desire at that point because you're desiring what he wants you to have so exactly so how do we delight ourselves in Yahweh well in Isaiah 58 13 it says if you turn away f your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight the holy day of Yahweh honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways nor finding your own pleasure nor speaking your own words then you shall delight yourself in Yahweh, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Right it's there, about the Sabbath. Right there it tells you you're supposed to be reading and studying Torah. Yeah. Because if you're not speaking your words, who's already speaking? Exactly. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate there in day and night, especially on the Sabbath. That's exactly because this is his holy day. So Yahweh is testing us with his Sabbath. So what can we do to pass the test? Well, the first thing that we're instructed to do is to remember the Sabbath, and that's from Exodus 28. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the second thing, it's in that same verse, it's to keep it holy. In verse 11 it says, For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Go ahead. So the third thing is to have a holy assembly. And Hebrews is talking about this in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Does that mean going to church on Sunday and Wednesday? Some people it does, but that's not where it was originally given. In Leviticus 23, verse 1, it says, Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the Israelites and say, The solemn festivals of Yahweh to which you will be summoned, summon them are my sacred assemblies. And that is mikra in Hebrew. The festivals is moedim plural, moed is a singular. So these are my sacred assemblies, or mikrad. These are my solemn moedim. You will work for six days, but the seventh day will be a day of complete rest, a day for the sacred assembly on which you do no work at all. Wherever you live, this is a Sabbath for Yahweh. So we're commanded to have a holy assembly on his Shabbat. So just sitting at home and doing nothing is not actually what it was talking about in Exodus. We're not to do our own pleasure. We're not to go out and look for manna. We're not to go out and collect sticks because the guy did that in Numbers 15 and he was executed for it. So we're to seek his will and we're to assemble together so we can leave our dwelling to assemble but not to seek our own pleasure. The fourth thing we're to do is not to work. In Exodus 29 it says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of, Sabbath of Yahweh. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. So not working is also part of keeping it holy. We're to remember it, to keep it holy, and part of the way we do that is by not working on it. So Exodus 35, 1. Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which Yahweh has commanded you to do. 
Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be holy for you, a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. That is a serious thing. Okay, I understand that the Jews in the rabbinic, if you spit on the ground, uh, then it's a, a breaking the Sabbath. But if you spit on a rock, it's not. Yeah. Meaning that you have to cover, because of the law, you have to cover the spit. You can't cover the, okay. Yeah, that would so be. What is the definition of work? The definition of work, personally, anything that makes me sweat. <laughs> That's the personal definition I use. It's kind of a thing of the spirit. It's called halakha. How do you interpret it? What is work? Well, obviously your profession, whether you're sweating or not, if you're a computer geek, you don't do your computer stuff on the Sabbath. You take it off and you rest as under Yahweh. And um, we used to do martial arts, and it, their tournaments were always on the Sabbath. We never competed in the tournaments. That definitely would have been work. So we didn't do that. We, we chose to honor the Lord. I brought that up. In the Amplified Bible, the translation, it translates it, no uh, employment, no personal gain. Well, it lists in some of the other Moedim, like the first day of unleavened bread and the last day, the first day of Sukkot and the last day, it talks about not doing customary work or s servile work, it says in one place, working for another person. Well, this is more restrictive. This is no work. So the Jews have taken it to the point where you don't carry a burden. When we were in Israel at an at a, uh, observant hotel, they got offended when we picked up the guitar and did praise and worship. They don't even want you picking up an ink pen and taking notes. That's picking up a burden. They don't want you tearing your toilet paper on the Sabbath. That's changing something. Their elevators stop on every floor. You don't push any buttons because you're changing things if you do. So they take it to an extreme, which you can't fault them for it. But if they try to say you're sinning for not doing it, it's just like what Yeshua said. There's nothing wrong with washing your hands. But when you condemn somebody for not washing your hands before you eat, you're going above and beyond the Torah. That's halakha, that's personal application. And we all need to have that from the Holy Spirit. What is he convicting us of? If it's clear in the Torah, we need to do it. But if it's not clear exactly how to do that, we need to be led by the Spirit. That's where the Spirit and the truth come together. Oh, I, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out, Yeshua makes it very plain that uh, there's a big difference between the rabbinic law, oral Torah, and what the Torah actually says, the heart of the Torah is that salvific works are always permitted on Shabbat. And there are jobs like being a doctor, an ambulance driver, a police officer, a military person. These are, there's people that have to be uh, in place in order to keep other people safe and alive. And so therefore they have to work no matter what day of the week. Just like the priest worked on Shabbat and they did not sin because they brought offerings. And Yeshua even said that they were breaking the Sabbath, but it was not, they weren't condemned for it because that was a commandment that was above and beyond even because they were to always do the sacrifices to atone or even circumcise. Yeshua talked about that you circumcise a man child on the eighth day, you're breaking the Sabbath, but yet that's a higher command even that we're, we are to keep. It's just like the Holy Convocation. That is a higher command than staying in your house on the Sabbath not going out and it talks about, we're going to look at it here in a minute, about not kindling a flame in your habitation on the Sabbath. Well, when you drive an internal combustion engine, you're kindling a flame, but yet to have a holy convocation is a higher commandment. So if you don't live in a community where you can just walk to shul or to the synagogue or whatever, then you need to drive your car to get there to be able to have that holy convocation because that's what he wants us to do. It says, then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, these are the words which Yahweh has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be holy for you, a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. And we saw that example in Numbers 15 when that man was out picking up sticks. And that was talking about later on, if you sin with a high hand, if you sin intentionally, you will be cut off. And that's what he's talking about. You'll be put to death. That is a, it's a sin unto death. It's flat out what it is. So he is serious about us not working. But like you said, sometimes there's things when you have to. And Yeshua even talks about pulling an ox out of a ditch. Healing on the Sabbath day. There's things that he did that violated their traditions, but it didn't violate the heart of Yahweh. No, not the spirit of the Torah. Well, don't you think that today 
it's that way. But if we have been living according to his Torah throughout the generations and still be living it today, we wouldn't need those police officers and ambulance drivers and things like that. Yeah, that's the kicker. If everybody kept Torah, then it would be that way. But unfortunately, our enemies don't. So <laughs> that's why you have to have a standing army and you have to have a police force and everything else. When he comes back and he's ruling with a rod of iron, the whole point is, though, still, you've got people that don't know him because at the end, there's more people destroyed than ever before. The greatest destruction that earth has ever seen is going to happen right at the end of the thousand-year reign with Yeshua ruling in the flesh for a thousand years. But yet when Satan is released for a short season, he deceives the, goes and corrupts the nations, deceives them. They gather as the sand of the seashore at Jerusalem, and then fire rains down from heaven and destroys them. The greatest destruction of flesh this earth has ever seen. Well, my question is, since not everyone keeps Torah, but um, I know buying and selling is not technically a commandment. However, in a Torah community no one would be working so there wouldn't be anything to sell but since going out in the world you know a pagan person keeping pagan days isn't that kind of making them work and and this is kind of a two-parter question that that's causing them to to sin making them work even though you're not the one doing it and the other issue is aren't there certain holy days where servile work is permitted and um it's like the Sabbaths for everyone and other holy days are just for the community. I think. There's one of them, I believe it's the first and last day of Passover where it says you are allowed to prepare food where normally you're not. Yeah, well, the first day of unleavened bread, I'm sorry. Uh, first day and last day of unleavened bread. So it mentions that you can do that very specifically. But um, the Passover itself is not actually a Sabbath. That was the only one that was commanded for only Israel. You have to be circumcised in order to keep the Passover. Then that, that is talking about the sacrificed lamb. In order to eat of the sacrificed lamb, you have to be circumcised. Unleavened bread was kept by everybody. You see Paul talking about it in 1 Corinthians, what is it, 11, 10 or 11? Anyway, um, but yet for Passover, you had to be circumcised. And that is, it's actually a sign of being part of the bride. It talks about in Isaiah 19 how that, there's coming a revival in Egypt in these last days. It's not there yet, obviously. And there's going to be one in Assyria. And it says, and at that time, Israel will be one of three. He says, Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hand, and Israel, my inheritance. There's a distinction made. Israel is, in, is in his inheritance. It's always been his wife. Egypt and Assyria are not. Although in order to be saved, they have to be born again. In order to be his people, they have to enter covenant with him, and it's only through the blood of the Lamb at that point. So what's the deal? You can be circumcised in your heart and still be part of Egypt and part of Assyria. You are saved. And if you even look in the new heavens and new earth, in the new Jerusalem, there's going to be the nations that are saved that come and bring their wealth and their strength to the new Jerusalem, which is called the Lamb's wife. So there's a distinction even there. Everything we're doing in this life is a test. And... It's a matter of becoming born again is the first step. Yeshua says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So the first step is we've got to become a branch in the body of Messiah. But then he says you have to abide and you have to bear fruit. So we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But then there's even higher levels that we can enter in. We know when we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, which was our Brit Hadashah portion for this week, he talks about that whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches men so, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches him will be called great. So there's going to be levels of reward based on your obedience to Torah, for one thing. But there's also going to be different levels of intimacy. Now, Titus and Galatians refused to be circumcised because the Judaizers were saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. And that was a lie. So Titus refused to do it because Paul goes on and says, if you're circumcised to be saved, basically, it says... Messiah prophets you nothing. You lose your salvation. You've gone into works religion, and you've given up the grace that Yeshua freely gives to everybody. But yet, obviously, it didn't lose its merit because he had Timothy circumcised, and the difference is they were both just as saved as one another, but Timothy could go into the temple and worship in the house of Yahweh, where Titus could not. 
It's a matter of intimacy. How intimate do you want to be with Yahweh? Well, circumcision, circumcision in the flesh is the same thing. Circumcision of the heart is required. If you're going to be his people, if you're going to live for all eternity with him, you're going to be circumcised in your heart. But in Ezekiel, I believe it's chapter is it 44, somewhere around there, it says, No stranger that's uncircumcised in heart or in flesh will come into my sanctuary. If you want to see the Lord during the thousand-year reign, and you're not physically circumcised, it's not going to happen. You have to be circumcised in heart and in flesh to be able to go into the sanctuary, even in the thousand-year reign. So it's a matter of how intimate, how close do we want to get. It's not just a matter of salvation, but how close do I want to be to him. So there's different things that we can learn as we study. We haven't been taught them in the past, but he wants us to know because he wants us to all have a chance, and some don't choose to. There's nations that are saved, and they're saved for all eternity, but they're not part of the Lamb's wife. We all have a choice to be so, if we so choose. But not all of us are going to make that choice, and not all of us are required to. And one of us is not going to be more saved than the other. We'll be with him for all eternity, so it'll be awesome. But personally, I want to be as intimate as I can. That's just my own personal choice. So not working on the Sabbath is a very serious thing to Yahweh. It would seem to include outside activities other than assembling together. In Exodus 16 again, verse 28, says, Yahweh said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for Yahweh has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So that's part of it. He wants us to come together and have a holy assembly, but he doesn't want us pursuing our own things because this is his holy day. He wants us meditating, focusing on him. How can we fellowship together? How can we fellowship with one another, his body? What we do to the least of these, my brethren, he says, you've done it unto me. So he's wanting our time on this, his holy day. And once we understand it, and we understand that we can love him in a more intimate way by doing this, it's what we want to do. I want to be able to bless him with everything that's in me. So it's a joy. It's not a burden. And it's not even restrictive. Once I understand it, this is what I want to do. So it can't get any better than that. I think an easy way to understand this is to, we've all been there and done this, is if, if you're in a room and you've got a bunch of people, whether they're children, adults, or whatever, and you want to and need to teach them something or convey a message to them, the first thing you've got to do is to get them all stopped talking and visiting and doing whatever they want to do and get their mouth shut and their eyes and ears pointed forward and listening so then you can once they calm down then you can can talk to them yep. you can teach them something yep. it's a good, good illustration he's got to get us all together first so he can teach us his ways so the fifth thing we're commanded to do is to rest and in Exodus 35 2 it says work shall be done for six days but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh so everything we do in word or in deed, we're to do as unto him, and even resting on the Sabbath, we're to do it as unto him. It's a thing of worship. Amen. So the sixth thing we're to do is to kindle no fire. And that comes from Exodus 35.3. It says, you shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So this is one of those commandments. It's called a chuchim. doesn't make any sense in the natural why we do it. He just says, don't do this. There's no logical reason for it. <laughs> oh, the chuckums of <laughs> Yahweh. We'll keep, we'll keep the, what, what do you call it? The, the chuckums with Simcha. <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was an old hillbilly guy trying to teach the Torah and the Hebrew, but he didn't know quite how to <laughs> pronounce it, so <laughs> it looked a little ridiculous. But <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath today. Why? Well, some people think it's because it was a lot of work. They, they thought that, well, maybe you had to rub two sticks together to <laughs> make a fire. But they didn't understand. The Israelites all had fires going all the time, just like on the altar. And they never let them go out. So if your fire, for some reason, went out, you just went to your next-door neighbor and borrowed some of his coals and brought them back on your head. And that's what Yeshua is talking about. It says you'll heap coals of fire on your enemy's head. Well, that's blessing them. Their fire went out, and you're giving them coals to win them over with love is what it's talking about. So anyway, you just go over and get some and put it back and no work to it really. Today you can just take a bick and flick it. So there's a lot of people who think, so, well, I'm not working. 
But what you're doing is creating a flame where there was none before. And what Yahweh did was he ceased from his creation. And that's a picture of creating something. I think that's personally what he's talking about is you're not to create something on the Sabbath where there was nothing like that before. But in a battery, the fire is already there. You're just flicking a switch, letting it out. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a big lighter where you're striking the flint and making a flame. Yeah, which, which is why we bring a fire on the Sabbath and transfer the flame. We're not kindling a new one. It's lit before the Sabbath starts. And so you can transfer a flame, but creating a new one where there was none before, that's, I mean, it was commanded to keep the menorah lit all the time. So they had fire burning on the Sabbath, and they might even have to take a lamp and, and trim it if it goes out and relight it on the Sabbath. They just transferred the flame. They weren't kindling a new flame. So. Well, it, like, I mean, if you've got a heater or furnace or something, they come on and go off automatically. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not physically doing anything. And the same thing with air conditioning or whatever. But like at our house, in a lot of houses, I usually keep a, a burner going on the stove I'm real low. I light it the night before, the day before, you know, before sundown. That way we've got uh, something that you could, if you had to cook something or like heat some water or something, you've got a, a flame already lit. Yeah. Yeah. And we do the same thing, but with a candle basically. So, so we try to honor him, even though it's not work, we just still try to do something that he says, don't do it. So we try not to do it. We know that it honors him and he doesn't want us to. And it's a way of loving our father. So, but there again, it's a thing of halakha. If you have the understanding that it's work to do one and you don't feel convicted of light flicking a bick or whatever, I've got a brother like that. He smokes. And so he smokes on the Sabbath, <laughs> flicks his bick and lights a cigarette. And that's, he doesn't feel convicted. That's between him and Yahweh. I'm not going to judge another man's servant. I'll pray for him because it's not a sin unto death. It wasn't the death penalty to go out and light a fire in your dwelling or whatever. So I'll pray for him, and that's my responsibility. Satan is seeking to destroy all of us, to deceive all of us. And we are our brother's keeper. Cain missed it there. He was Abel's keeper. He was, we're all supposed to look out for one another. So we're corporately responsible for one another. So anyway, go ahead and scroll down. I think we're done here. So finally, the seventh command is to keep the Sabbath, to carefully guard it. After we've learned what Yahweh expects of us, he then commands that we obey. He warns that if we refuse, we will be cut off from his people. Exodus 31, 13 says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. And we see that in, in Numbers chapter 15 when that man was out gathering sticks right after the Father gives us the commandment not to work on Sabbath. He did it willfully and intentionally and they took him out and executed him. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. An eternal covenant. The Sabbath is the sign of the eternal covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So what if you say, well, I'm a Gentile, though. I'm not an Israelite. Well, then you're not actually part of the covenant because Paul talks about the commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians 2. It says, you were Gentiles in the flesh, but now because of the blood of Messiah, you've been made nigh to the commonwealth of Israel. And the covenants of promise, and that word is plural there. So you might be uncircumcised, but it doesn't mean you're a Gentile. The Gentile, the Goyim, were the nations other than Israel. Israel was the covenant people. And in order to be in covenant with Yahweh, the new covenant, if you go out and study it, it's written in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. It says, there's coming a day when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He didn't make a covenant with Gentiles. You had to become one of those two houses to be part of that covenant. And that's what Yeshua's pointing out. That's what Paul's pointing out. You who were Gentiles in the flesh, you've been made part of the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise and the God of Israel. 
So we are literally part of his body. There's only one body of Messiah, and it is called the Commonwealth of Israel. The word church is a complete and total mistranslation of the Greek word ekklesia. It's, sometimes the translators would translate a word, and then sometimes they would transliterate a word when they didn't want to translate it, like baptisma in the Greek. It means to fully immerse. Well, they were sprinkling at the time, so they just made a new word up in English called baptism based on the phonetic sounds of the Greek word baptisma. So that way they didn't have to translate it and make them look like they were doing wrong, because they were. Same thing with deacon. Diakonos is the Greek, and it meant servant. Well, that was a lofty office back then, so they didn't want to translate it. They, wanted to, they just made up a new word in English, deacon, and it sounded like a pretty neat thing. So anyway, the word, word ekklesia is not translated by church, nor is it transliterated. That's a word that was just pulled out of thin air by the Catholic Church to make it look like there's a different entity rather than being part of the Commonwealth of Israel. It's replacement theology. That's what it's based on. And there is no such thing as a church that is separate from the Commonwealth of Israel. Matter of fact, in the King James, in Acts chapter 7, it talks about the church that was in the wilderness with Moses, and that is the true church. It's the commonwealth of Israel. It was always God's covenant people. Now, Paul talks about that because of unbelief, there were some of the natural branches that were broken off in Romans 11, and wild olive branches grafted in, but the tree never changed. It didn't become a new tree, a different tree. It had the same root and the same trunk, and some of the natural branches remained in it. It's just that wild olive branches were grafted in it and became partaker of the root and the fatness it talks about. So. It's always been about the Commonwealth of Israel. It's translations that have thrown a lot of confusion into the works. I was just going to. I was just going to say you might mention uh, in John 15, Yeshua says, "I am the true vine, and ye are the branches." And then again, uh, you read in Ezekiel, uh, I think it's like 46, 47, somewhere in there, where the the Gentiles are to be adopted into one of the 12 tribes. Yeah. So it says, the stranger that's in your midst that bears children among you, they will be given an inheritance in whatever tribe they dwell in, and it says they will be considered native born at that point. And it, the only other place in scripture that talks about that is in Exodus 12, where we just read it this last week, that says when a stranger in your midst wants to keep the Passover, then let all his uh, males be circumcised, and then he shall come and keep the Passover, and then he will be considered native born. So circumcision of the flesh is what gets you plugged in. Or if you're a woman and you're bearing children in the land of Israel, whatever tribe you dwell in, then you'll be given an inheritance and you'll be considered native born. So he makes a way for man and woman to be able to be physically part of Israel, the bride of Messiah. It's always been the lamb's wife. So, Yep, like Ruth, exactly. So keeping the Sabbath is a sign of our covenant with Yahweh. Go ahead and scroll down. And it's for everybody, as we see in Isaiah 56, 1. It says, Thus says Yahweh, Keep justice and do righteous, for my salvation is about to come. And that word in Hebrew is Yeshua, the word for salvation. My Yeshua is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Nor the eunuch say, which the eunuch couldn't enter into the congregation because of, of being mutilated. Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Go ahead, Michael. And also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh, to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the Sabbath is just not for Jews or natural-born Israelites. It's for all, and all who keep it will be greatly rewarded. 
So if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed? And heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. Abraham's all of our fathers, if we're in Messiah, because we're all part of the commonwealth of Israel. And it was the covenant that Yahweh established with Abraham that we're made partakers of. Now that covenant was added to in uh, is, let's see, it's Genesis 15 that God initially establishes the covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 12, he calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees. Genesis 15, he makes the blood-stained path with the animals he has split into. And then Genesis 17, he adds circumcision. So it's an unfolding of the covenant. It's the same covenant. And then it goes on to the children of Israel, and at Mount Sinai, there's even more unveiled. And it's the same covenant when Yeshua comes. It's a new covenant, but what are the writings of the new covenant? In Jeremiah 31... He says, when I make this new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. The writings of the new covenant is his Torah. The instructions did not change. They were internalized by the Holy Spirit. That's what the new covenant is. is not only do the prophets have the Holy Spirit, but now everybody has the Holy Spirit in the new covenant. Uh, what I find interesting is the church interpretation of, of he will fulfill it. But it really means he came to show us how to live it. Yep. That's the correct translation. Well, it's a Hebrew idiom is what it is. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. To abolish it meant to wrongly interpret it. To fulfill it meant to teach it correctly. And that's what he was talking about. They all understood what he was saying back then because it was part of their culture. Today we don't quite pick up on that. But even saying that he fulfilled it by keeping it all, which is untrue because he didn't keep it all. He kept everything that applied to him. He didn't keep any of the commandments only for a woman after her menstrual cycle or anything that just applied to Aaronic priests because he wasn't one. Hebrews makes that clear. He kept the commandments that applied to him as a man from Judah. So to say that because he kept it, he did away with it is completely ridiculous because he didn't even keep it all. He kept everything that applied to him. But to fulfill it meant that it was all pointing towards something particular and it was him if you uh, believe Moses you'd believe me because Moses wrote of me he said in another place it was all about the Messiah and so he was the fulfillment of part of it in that aspect that it was pointing to him in his first coming the rest of its pointing towards his second coming and then a thousand year reign and then a new heavens and a new earth so eventually he's going to fulfill all of it in that aspect but right now he didn't fulfill all of it well, I just wanted to say that people say he kept he fulfilled all that but he didn't and it's, he didn't fulfill, he hasn't fulfilled the second half of that. Exactly. He has not returned. I tell Christians, I say, has he returned like he prophesied? No. So therefore, we're still under the Torah. It actually says, till heaven and earth passes away. Not one jot or one tittle will pass away till it's all fulfilled. Now, I've got another icon down at the bottom. It's a picture. Click on that. Because the jots and the tittles were actually part of a Matthew 5 where Yeshua was talking about it. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law of prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth is passed away, not one jot or one tittle will pass away from the law till it's all fulfilled. So what are the jots and the tittles? There's an icon on the bottom of the computer screen that has a picture. It's part of the picture library. There it is. Now this is the Hebrew, and I've got it actually in the Tanakh that you can look at. It's a little more clear. Go ahead and put it back the way I had it. little large. Now go up. See the ayin on the far right, it's enlarged, and then the dalit on the far left. Hebrews read from right to left. This is Shema Israel. You see Sheen, Mem, and then ayin is the last letter of the Shema. Ayin, if you look at pictographic Hebrew, ayin was a picture of an eyeball. That's what the letter was written as in the uh, the Dalit was always a door. So it says, Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, or is one. So the last letter of Echad is the Dalit. Now the Ayan, basically, the rabbis don't know what to do with all the jots and the tittles. There's 22 of them, like I said. The jots are actually dots that are placed above one of the words, above each letter, and it's just to amplify or to point something out, just like the large ion and the large dalit. What does that mean? Doesn't say. But there is a meaning behind it because Yeshua said not one jot or one tittle, and this is considered a tittle here, would pass away from the Torah till it's all fulfilled. Well, what it basically means is 
whoever has eyes to see will know that Yeshua is the door. Because he said that. He says, I'm the door. And when he says, I and my Father are one in John 10, he's referring to the Shema. And the Shema, literally, in the jots and the tittles, are pointing out exactly what he said. If you have eyes to see, you'll know that I am, like he said in another point. And they all fell down backwards. He says, I am the door. So the jots and tittles have meaning if you have eyes to see. Because it's on a spiritual level. There's, there's different ways that you can understand Torah, that you can study Torah. And paradise, or pardes, is kind of an acronym that will help you remember it. The Peshat is the literal interpretation. That's the first level of study, and it means what it says. The drash, or um, the uh, remez, is something that refers back to something else. Like when Yeshua is teaching um, about John the Baptist, what did you come out and see? To see a reed shaking in the wind? What does that mean? Well, he was referring to a parable of the time where it was called the, the oak and the reed. And, and it goes, the, there's a mighty oak that stands for righteousness. And he won't bend with the storms of life. And then there's this reed that bends with every wind that comes along and just goes with the flow, basically. And Well, there comes a storm so strong that the oak is broken. But the wind continues to, the reed continues to bend and sway with the wind and it's still there. And he's saying, well, what did you come out to see? A reed shaking in the wind? And they said, no. They came out to see the mighty oak that would stand for righteousness. And it cost him his life. But that's, they knew what he was talking about. But that's, that's called a remez. He's referring to something that they already knew. And drash is what we're going to go over and do. The midrash, where everybody kind of comes and brings their part. The Talmud's based off of that. Off of all the different rabbis' opinions you glean from what their opinions are, except most of them are garbage, so you can't glean a whole lot. But <coughs> the original part, the Mishnah of the Talmud, there was some stuff that Paul was taught by Gamaliel. He was actually, he's in the Mishnah. Uh, Hillel and Shammai, they were two rabbis, two Pharisees that were actually before the time of Yeshua. Some of their stuff's in there, but they didn't even agree together, so they had some things you could glean from, but once they rejected Yeshua, blindness came on Israel. And Yeshua says, basically, it's the blind leading the blind. He said, you're of your father the devil. The ones that rejected him, they were broken off because of unbelief, just like he said. So the majority of the teachings in Judaism can't be trusted because it's done by people that were broken off. They're no longer part of the body. They're no longer part of the commonwealth of Israel. They can be grafted back in again, though, and that's the message that we need to understand. We are to present the gospel to them so they can be. And we support a ministry in Israel that's actually doing that, a messianic brother that was trained as a rabbi. He never actually got his smicha and became a rabbi, but he went to yeshiva and everything else and then met the Messiah. And so he is reaching his brothers in Israel in ways that I've never seen before. He actually had some, a couple of different well-known Orthodox rabbis come up to him this last week or two, and they wanted to know more about Yeshua. And it was just amazing. They actually approached him. Normally he's going to them and, and ministering, but these guys came to him. We, they said, we know that there's something there. And so the fathers is really moving on the hearts of even the Orthodox now. So. Well, it's all in the prayer books and everything. Yeah. The name is all through it. Yeshua is. Now it ends with the feminine hey. So it's not the normal Yeshua ends with an I, and that's the masculine form for the Messiah. But in the prayer books, it ends in the feminine form, but it's still, you can see it there, and it sounds the same. So yeah, his name is all over. Yeah, in the rabbinic yeah. writings. Mm -hmm. you know, winding and unwinding his bandages. But anyway, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what the jots and tittles really are. Like I said, there's 22 different ones. And uh, they point towards the Messiah himself. Even that's why he says not one jot or one tittle will pass away till it's all fulfilled. Even the things that aren't obvious in our English translations are there for a reason. So anyway, let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of being able to come together as your people Israel. Natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah Yeshua. Father, you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing of your people Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, P'navelecha. Vihunecha Yesah Yahweh Penavelecha 
וישים לך שלום. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In the name of Yeshua our Messiah. Amen and amen. 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 Amen.